Today um, I'm going to be covering advanced domain hacking and uh, pivoting across a, a network or just pivoting uh, off different boxes. Uh, so uh, first things first, uh, if you want to get in touch with us afterwards, we're going to be staying after, but uh, if you want to email us or contact us on Slack or if you want to see where we're going to post this video or the slides, uh, here's the website. And if you want to be added to the mailing list, uh, you can just you know check the box that says add to mailing list. Um, so uh, another thing is a couple events and announcements that we're going on. So uh, we have lab hangouts uh, every Thursday at 4 o'clock in the lab ECS 4.619. And basically, it's where Jake and uh, whoever, else, wh whoever else is there, if there's any more officers there, we just kind of hang out, uh, talk about security. If you have any questions, you can drop by, and uh, we'll be happy to answer anything. Also, if you uh, signed up for the State Farm CTF, I uh, highly recommend that you start to join a competition team or create a team. If you don't know who you're going to be teams with, you should find some people to be teams with uh, and do that. Uh, so without further ado, I guess I'll just get started right into the topic. Uh, here's a little overview of uh, some, some things I'm going to be covering. Uh, recon, basically looking for information. Uh, enumerating the network, looking for more information in different ways. Uh, attack routing, which is actually starting to attack and see uh, what you can do inside of the network now that you've passed the firewall and you're uh, less likely to be stopped with, with traffic. Um, and then uh, process injection, just a privilege escalation technique. Uh, token impersonation, another privilege escalation or pivoting technique. And uh, some defense mechanisms if you host a Windows domain or if you want to know how you can stop this from happening. Uh, so first with recon. Uh, this may seem a little intuitive, uh, but it's something that I like to go over because not very many people will remember to do this when they get on a box or whenever they first pop a box. And so basically, it's just looking for information. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people just store their passwords in plain text. Uh, again, that seems like that wouldn't happen in 2018 with all like security news and people telling people not to do that. But you still see, you know, Janice from accounting. Not if there's anyone named Janice here, then I'm sorry. But uh, storing her passwords in a text file, saying like username, password for different accounts. So snoop around for that. Go to private folders. Go to any folder that you can look at that someone may have used. Um, I I uh, I highly recommend also looking at like maintenance schedules because you can tell when an admin is going to be on the box or is going to run a service that has administrative privileges on that box that you may be able to use a couple of the other techniques I'll say later in this video or in this talk. Um, so another thing is browser activity. A lot of, I don't want to talk about a specific tool, but Metasploit has a lot of good modules where you can just dump browser data and look through it. And uh, Chrome and Firefox have an edge, I don't know, Edge that much. I don't know that many people that use Edge, but they've done a lot of things to secure that. But it still can leak, and you know you can get some information out of it. Um, cache browser passwords. People tend to use the same password, so if you can get cache browser password from Chrome or uh, any other uh, web browser, that's great. That's information that you can use. And uh, persistence. So. If you can take if you can take your time with the penetration test, or if you're trying to enumerate a network and you have unlimited amount of time or a decent amount of time, you can always just drop a keylogger. Uh, make sure you remember that you dropped a keylogger because again, you should remove that when you're done. Um, but you can kind of just wait, see if someone types in a password, see if you can pick up that they've typed a password. Um, you can get really fancy with keylogger scripts. Again, I don't want to cover any specific tools. But you can get fancy of like if someone's typing in a username field, or if they open up a certain application to start logging, or something like that. Um, another thing is if you're waiting, uh, you can start capturing the data uh, on the system. So you can kind of just see who's logging into the box and see if an administrator logs in to check something at any point. Uh, a lot of the times, admins uh, will do updates. And they'll just log in through RDP, or they'll physically go and get on the box and log into administrator and have services running. And uh, a lot of the times, people don't know these services are running on their PC because they just connect. They're just connected to the domain. Another one that's not as common but still can be done is intercepting traffic for information. 
So with another technique that I'm going to show, you can intercept, you can capture all the traffic by routing all of your attacks inside of a network. And so by routing all of your attacks, it'll be really easy uh, to, to capture any data that may be going through the network. And again, a lot of it's encrypted nowadays, but you never know, you might catch something that will let you pivot. Um, before I go on to uh, enumeration, uh, recon is a, a, all about just gathering as much information as possible and being as quiet as possible while doing it. So a lot of people forget about this. And um, recon can take a while and may not seem to have a big reward, but sometimes you can get lucky with a couple of things. So I highly recommend that you, you know, at least use it when you're, you're in pivoting, maybe even as a last resort, or if you just start out, you use recon and then you move on. Uh, so um, from here, I want to talk about attack routing uh, before enumeration, because you can use attack routing or routing through the network to help with enumeration uh, when you're inside of the network. So attack routing basically is after you've broken into the route, you want to route ev all of your traffic. Instead of coming through the firewall and having maybe something dropped, you want to route all of your attacks on the user that you've popped box. Because if you do that, you're less likely to be caught because it looks like traffic coming from that computer instead of a foreign source. So you're still piping traffic to that computer, but because you've put persistence and you've done everything you can on that box, uh, you can leave a. Uh, you, you're less likely to have dropped a connection if you route all of your attacks than if you were to just push through and use all of your attacks on that. So um, with enumeration, you know, you can find exploits, you can do all the stuff, but then you want to attack a box on the network, but you don't have access to that box from your computer. So basically, you can set up a route. Uh, Metasploit has a really easy way to do it. It's basically just add route and then the subnet that you want to route to. Um, and you can route all of your traffic uh, through that so that it'll, again, be less noticeable. Also, if you're using PSExec, which Jake presented last time, um, you, need to, you don't need to have a routed at or, or um, an added route, but it, it helps a lot in speed and also password attempts. Uh, when I do enumeration, I'm going to demo a couple of ways that you can see the password limits and some enumerated data you can get from just being a local user. Uh, without even being a domain admin or an admin at all. Uh, so routing attacks is a really good way to um, prevent yourself from being caught and also being able to put more attacks out. So uh, this is just a, a diagram I want to demonstrate to show you kind of for people who don't know what pivoting is or what we're trying to do here. Uh, but basically, like, let's say that you're in marketing. Um, or sales, sorry. Uh, if you're in sales and you're San Francisco domain, and you want to get uh, your, you want to get across to, and you've you've completely attacked everything you can in the San Francisco domain, and you cannot get domain controller, you cannot get domain admin, you can't you can't pivot anymore. Well, maybe there's another box that you can get to, that has a service that's running that you can exploit. Maybe that person has a plain text password. Maybe the uh, administrator is logged into that box and they have cash passwords. You can go, to, you can route to another box from inside the network and pivot to the Seattle domain, for example, by uh, connecting to another service inside of that network. Because although the networks are subnetted off, they still can communicate with each other, and you're more likely to break into um, the Sa Seattle domain from the San Francisco domain rather than if you're somewhere completely different and not inside of their domain. Um, this picture doesn't really show uh, connections between this, the domains by a computer, but a lot of the times uh, companies will have services that connect to multiple of the subnets, excuse me, and you basically want to uh, break that service. So imagine if in between the San Francisco domain and the Seattle domain, there was a service that everyone was using and it was serving to everyone. You would want to attack that box and pivot from there to the Seattle domain using uh, some sort of technique. So this is where you see the benefit of, of routing attacks instead of just attacking from your own domain, uh, from your own IP address, I guess. So we go on to enumeration. Uh, this is where the uh, 
quote unquote hacking or what most people would consider to you starting your enumeration process to go. So enumeration, you basically want to enumerate the network first. You want to see where you are, what's around you. Um, it's not advised to necessarily run an Nmap scan in, inside of the network, but if you can see the domain, if you can find some information about the network, which I'm about to show some commands that you can do, um, you can find a lot of information, and you won't need to necessarily trigger any alarms by doing that. Uh, so you can also try to uh, connect to the domain controller. If you find the IP address, which is usually the domain, um, you can connect to it and try to use passwords you've already gathered from recon or any boxes you've popped. Or if you had a phishing scheme going on, you can kind of password guess against that. And, um, and you can password against with the information you get from uh, gathering information about the domain, which is basically finding uh, users and um, password policies and security policies. And by finding users, you can find out what usernames you want to attack against. So you're not blindly just putting in names and hoping that they're users. Instead of uh, attacking a password that there's a seven password attempt maximum before the account gets locked out and the domain admin gets notified, you can password guess five times so that the person that actually uses that box will have a little bit of leeway to mistype their password one or two times. You don't want to lock someone out of their box because that gets suspicious. And that's why locking your box after several attempts is used, so that people can find out if someone's trying to get on their box. Uh, user groups is also useful because you want to see not only what users you have, but you also want to see what groups they're in because the group name or the groups in general could distinguish what type of user they are. If you see a lot of guest users and you've enumerated and you've cracked a lot of the guest users, you should probably stop hacking guest users because there's no point in hacking a guest user over and over again if uh, they, they don't have access to anything else in the network. You'd want to go somewhere where they're like an administrator, or maybe there's another group that has more privileges. And uh, you can enumerate more from there. Um, so after that, you also want to enumerate services. So service accounts oftentimes don't really have uh, as much security as we would like. Um, so you can possibly try to password against it and see service attacks. Sometimes service accounts don't even have passwords to begin with if they're a really old, outdated service. And a lot of the times they are because most of the time domain admins run a service, it's working, no one's complaining about it, so they don't update it, they don't touch it, they just leave it be. Um, so you can always get to looking at enumerated services and see if there's something possibly you could get to there. And so I'm going to quickly go to um, my Kali box. And uh, I'm on the same domain that uh, Jake made last time. Uh, and I've, I'm right where he left off, except for I didn't get to the domain controller yet. I'm right before that point. So if I have a interpreter session, and you don't necessarily need to have a interpreter session if, if you just have shell. So I'm going I'm to go into shell here. And I'm in Janice's downloads folder. Uh, so we want to kind of uh, see what kind of more information we can get from this. Now, uh, CMD can kind of is, is not as like intuitive because it doesn't have autocomplete and stuff like that. But you have Google as your expense, so kind of just look around for stuff. But here's a couple of commands that I use to find some more information about a network uh, that I'm on. So if I type in net users, um, I can see all of the accounts that are local. But that doesn't really give me any help, because I don't care about local accounts if I'm already mm, uh, admin on the account. Uh, and so I want to find domain. So I, I, I type in net users slash domain. And now I see that there's Janus, administrator, SSHD, um, and a couple of other accounts, Omega Super Admin. Uh, and, and those are the accounts I want to be going for, because they are the ones that can really help me get to the domain. And then we can also see the, the domain controllers at dco1.tipsy.com. Um, and with that being said, notice some networks have multiple domain controllers. So just because you popped one domain controller doesn't mean you've necessarily popped all of the domain controllers. Um, domain linking, like they could all have the same password, and they could all be connected, but they also could not be. So make sure that you can get to all of them uh, before you say that you've pwned the entire network. So uh, another thing I said was uh, groups. We want to see what kind of groups these people are in. 
and where we can go from there. So we type in net uh, groups slash domain. Uh, we can see um, all the different types of groups. And uh, you can go in and enter in every single one of these and find the users for all of these groups. And so uh, that's just one of the ways you can kind of enumerate through what different groups there are and what groups you want to uh, attach to. Um, so make the, can you guys see this, or do I need to make it bigger? <coughs> OK, I'll make it bigger. Uh, zoom in. Uh, zoom in. OK, cool. Uh, so, uh, so basically, if you didn't see before, I basically just typed in net users uh, slash domain. And slash domain is like a, is like a generic term. Um, my session just died, which is fine. I just can open up another one. Um, but basically, uh, sessions or the uh, domain is an arbitrary term for any domain. You don't type in, like, the domain here is uh, tipsy.com. You don't type in tipsy.com or slash tipsy.com. You type in domain because it's trying to find any domain that is connected to this computer. Uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, my slides and we'll continue. So here's a couple of exploitation techniques that uh, I use and a lot of people use. And these are, although that we say these are advanced, um, these are pretty much like as much as scripting or as much as like the advance you can get before you get into reverse engineering and, uh, and enumerating specific services for uh, exploits there. So these are generalized exploits for um, most any network that you can see. And uh, a couple and things you should just check for. So process injection, you although you need an administrator to do this, you can get system by doing this. So administrator uh, has admin over the box, but then you can get system or you can get into different services uh, by injecting into the process. So let's say that you want to let's say that Nessus is running on the box. I don't know why Nessus would be running on a domain account uh, computer. But let's say Nessus or some sort of service is running at the current time. And you have an administrator. And you want to get to that box because you think that box may be able to let you pivot from that box to another point. So you can inject into the process and become that process and open up a shell into that process so that you can now run commands as that service account. And, and sometimes you might not even be running as the service account user, because there is no user, but you just be running straight from the process itself. Uh, a lot of times, this can be uh, volatile because you can the session can or the the process can crash because you're injecting into it, and also the process can uh, reject the fact that you were trying to inject inside of it. So therefore, it can close your session. So you always want to you know pass your session on to another box. There's a net, there's a really cool tool inside of Metasploit uh, called um, session injection. And basically, it allows you to take a whole other box and pass your session over to that box. So you've, you've broken into the box, and you want to pass your session so that in case your box goes down or your IP address goes banned, you have another box with another IP address that can still connect to the box without having to uh, have them click your virus or visit your website or do whatever. So session injecting or session passing is really useful in Metasploit. And you can do this in a lot of different ways. You can have um, any kind of persistence method, uh, really. But that's one of the more easier ways. Once you're an administrator, you can have multiple administrator accounts so that if your session does die, you don't you know, get out of luck. Uh, so next is um, token impersonation. So before we talked about Kerberos tickets, this is not that. Um, tickets and tokens are different. So basically, tokens are just given to the account. Um, and that token allows that account to do certain things on that computer. And that is the user session or the account session. And so you can impersonate these tokens sometimes when they're active and they're not encrypted or they're not secured properly. And you can impersonate them and do things as them. So un unlike, unlike process injection, where you're injecting into the current process, you're impersonating the token here. So in your, and when I mean impersonating, you're not taking the token away. You're forging a new token out of the one that you can sniff. And so, and when I mean sniff, I, I use that word just like broadly, not actually sniff as in traffic sniffing. Um, but you are basically taking the token 
and you're using the information you got and forging a new one so that you can load up another session or another process and be that service. And so it looks a little bit sus less suspicious if you impersonate a token rather than process injection and that process starts going haywire, crashes, and stuff like that. So um, that's a really good way to kind of lower your risk of crashing. But token impersonation is also harder to do than process injection because it m forces the account to be running active and the token to be exposed. And there's a really cool tool, also Metasploit, uh, you, or, and you can also download this tool to use regardless. It's called Mimikatz. And um, there's also another one called Kiwi. And both of these allow you to dump the current tokens that are inside of the session. So um, basically, if you're in the session and you are, um, if you're in the session and you impersonate the token, you can drop all, or you can show all the current tokens listed. And once you do that, you can select an individual token of a service account and then attack or forge the token, and the, it'll automatically forge it, and you're in. Uh, I'm going to quickly answer uh, one of the questions that you guys asked on uh, the slides. Does uh, net users domain show all domain users or only domain users that have touched that box? Um, it shows, it should show all users on the domain that it's allowed to see. Now. Whenever I do the defenses, a lot of the times your box may be locked to where you can't see other users or you can't use command prompt. So um, you sh it, depending on the, the security policy that's in place, you can either see all the users or only users connected to your box. Um, and so uh, I don't think I actually uh, demoed service uh, showing you guys how to see the password policy. So I'm going to really quickly uh, do that. So. Oh, wow, this powered off. OK. Uh, I'm going to just quickly start up that Windows. So this is the Windows install uh, for you. It's just a VM, basically. And, um, and all I'm doing is uh, it's connected to a domain, and the domain controller is running on an IP address. And this is on host-only network. So I don't want to log into Janus from accounting, because we already have administrators. So. So I'm going to log in as administrator. Um, so while this is loading, I'm going to go back. Uh, oh, it loaded. OK. So I'm just going to run this shell real quick. Or let me first make sure that run background. Basically, I'm just rerunning my handler right now, uh, and I'm going to go back to this. Uh, since we already popped administrator, I'm cheating here and running it as administrator. But you've already you would have already privileged escalated past this point. Um, so let me go back to this. And I accidentally clicked on it twice, but that's fine. Um, so we have two sessions here. Uh, let's go into session eight uh, sessions. And then let's go to shell. And if I type in net user or net, uh, I think it's net users, uh, net accounts domain. There you go. So uh, net accounts domain basically allows you to show the, the policy on the account. So we can see that the minimum password length is 7. So any password we might have gotten that is lower than 7, or any password that uh, we want to guess in the future, it must be over 7 and less than 42. Um, uh, and our, th this is days. So it must maximum is 42 days old. Uh, I don't think there is a maximum for length. So 
But uh, we can also see the passwords range from 1 to 42 days. So we know that if we want to con excuse me, continue on the box, then we should uh, definitely leave some sort of persistence after 42 days if our pen test goes that long, which typically it doesn't. Uh, and so uh, you can see the different thresholds. Um, there's no lockout threshold, which means the account will never be locked out, which means unlimited password guessing. Um, but there is an observation window. Uh, which is 30 minutes for duration and 30 minutes for observation window, which basically means that if the account were to be locked out, uh, you'd have 30 minutes of, of a uh, lockout. And then 30 minutes would be observation, which means the, uh, another security pos policy would be in place. So the uh, domain admin can actually set it so that if they get locked out for 30 minutes, that person's password, they have to type it in three times or two times, or they have to email. The, per, the domain admin to unlock their account, uh, some other security policy takes place during that time. Uh, so this is just another way for you to be able to see the kind of, uh, uh, the, the kind of inf like security policy and password from the domain, uh, which is enumeration. So uh, we've, we've looked at that. So if we want to go and uh, show tokens, which was token impersonation, um, basically, what we can do is load Mimikatz. Uh, again, this is just Metasploit. You can do this fit manually, but it's easier on Metasploit. So most of you will probably use that. Um, so if we load Mimikatz, we can type in help. And we notice that there's now a Mimikatz uh, help menu that we can see what we want. And so if we want to see uh, different, different information, we can you know, see different passwords by typing this in, and we can dump. And we see that we don't actually have access. Uh, it's memory read only. Um, and then there's another tool called Kiwi. So if we load Kiwi and we press help, we should see Kiwi is now right here. So if we want to see tokens, then we can basically Kerberos. Or no, it's sorry. It's load incognito, incognito. And if we type in help again, we see that now we can see the different uh, incognito options. Again, incognito is just a tool. Uh, so we can list tokens. And we can say we want users. And we can, say, we can see that there are uh, these, these number of tokens are distributed right now. These are all the tokens that are distributed. And these are the ones that we can impersonate. Um, because we're already the um, Tipsy administrator, uh, there's no point in going backwards unless we're trying to uh, exploit one of these services. Uh, font driver host is just like a default service on Windows. So that would be not very useful. But if there were someone uh, like an administrator running a service patch and they had their tokens open for us to impersonate, we could simply just uh, impersonate their tokens using impersonate, um, which basically is impersonate and copy and paste the, uh, the service itself. Um, another thing is I, I covered was process injection. So if we type in PS, we can see all of the different types of processes. So uh, let's say we want to uh, process inject into another, uh, for example, a system account. So if we can see right here, um, there is a system account running VM compute. I don't want to crash my VM. Um, the, <laughs> there, there is a system account running uh, here uh, that is SCV host, and the process number is right here. So if I type in migrate, 2336. This should be able to migrate. It's a bit on the finicky side. So if it doesn't migrate, I'm sorry. Uh, but let's see if it migrates. But basically, with the process migration, it's just in injecting. And no, it didn't want to migrate. Um, again, it's finicky. So sometimes you'll get it to work, sometimes you won't. And it's, it's not guaranteed that you can migrate into a session just because you're an administrator. Uh, even an administrator, a, a local administrator account can have you know, some things that are not uh, 
useful for a domain because you're trying to hack the domain, not the local box, uh, after you've gotten administrator. So um, this is a Metasploit only thing, but there's this thing called get system. And it's like a pwn all button, but not really a pwn all button because it only does privilege escalation and it only does three things. So, but it tells you what it does. So if we press it, um, we crashed. I think my VM crashed. I, this is not a very powerful computer. But. No, because my creation failed. Oh. Died. Yeah, OK. So basically, this is what I was talking about. Um, OK, so we still have session 9. So let's do session 9, get system. That's what I was talking about, by the way. Um, so it said name pipeline impersonated. So we basically uh, impersonated the name pipeline to get to get admin, and the admin was stored in memory. Basically, get system is like a uh, like a you can try and it might work. Uh, it only tries impersonating uh, this method. It also tries process injection and it also tries hash dumping and seeing if it can log in using that. Those are the three methods that I've seen it ever do. Uh, when I do get system. Um, and so basically, if we type in shell now, uh, we can type who am I and I'm system. Um, so that was, that was kind of like a last resort effort there. Uh, so another one that I talked about is adding route. Uh, so if I type in route, Basically, it shows me the different routes that I have uh, added right now. Um, notice how there is already this uh, 192.168.56.0. Uh, so basically, what this is saying in this uh, 101, this is basically saying that of all the things I can have, I can select this route, or I can. The, the, this is one of the possible routes. So if I route add. Uh, and then I think it's one nine. T it's the five six five six dot uh, one zero three. I believe is the IP address of my Windows box. Uh, then I should be able to uh, add a route to this network. Okay, this is not working right now. I don't remember the command. Um, well. OK. Uh, so route add 24 or 192.168.0 or 56.103.24, uh, 192.168.56.101. Is it 16? No. Yeah, so um, I'm already technically in the network because this box is local. So it might not be allowing me to reroute itself again to, to itself. Uh, that might be the problem. Um, but basically, what this allows you to do is, again, route attacks through uh, the box that you popped. Um, so if I go back, uh, here's a couple of defenses. It's kind of here. There's some obvious defenses is don't leave passwords in plain text. Uh, clear all cache passwords and don't leave uh, open administrator se or se administrator sessions open. Um, also, uh, lock down service accounts that only need to be run uh, once a year, maybe, or even if they need to be run constantly. Um, just make sure that the service accounts don't have uh, no password and they don't have privileges where they don't need to have privileges. Uh, and also encrypt traffic. Uh, so that's that's kind of the obvious ones. The less obvious ones. Um, is to segment groups to have different control over different parts of the subnet and make sure that they can't communicate outside of that network. And if you see a box doing that, you should red flag it and you should look into it because it shouldn't. Another thing is disabling uh, CMD and PowerShell. I did Metasploit in this, but there's another tool called PowerShell Empire. And it's another, it's Metasploit-ish type where you can run PowerShell scripts so that you can kind of evade um, um, Windows Defender. Windows Defender recently updated, so it detects PowerShell that's being run maliciously. But 
it used to be a really good way to run obfuscated PowerShell and get things that you normally wouldn't get with Metasploit, or you'd get blocked or stopped in Metasploit. Um, so, and also uh, disabling RDP on any anyone that's out external to your network. So if your administrator needs to install RDP, they have access to, but if someone is uh, outside of your network, they don't have access to. And also preventing users from being to able to RDP into each other rather than them, uh, rather than the admin uh, RDPing into them. And RDP is just remote desktop. Um, so someone asked the question, uh, what exactly is process injection doing? So process injection, it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it's basically taking an, un, well, this is another attack, unquoted service pass is another attack. Um, but Nick's looking at me funny. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, uh, in process injection basically takes the process and it injects code into the current process and runs that code in line with that process. Um, I could get into the nitty gritty about that. The, I, I don't even know how the memory, like how it works with memory and how it works with the process exactly. But I do know that it's basically just taking a snippet of malicious code and injecting it inside of uh, the process that's running. Um, and that's why it can crash it and that's why it's kind of unstable. Um, so yeah, that's basically um, it. Does anyone have any questions other than that? No? OK. That's, that's done. We're done. That's it. <laughs>